Welcome everyone to Sharing Soulful Stories. Today I am with a beautiful lady that I know as Anana, but she is also known as Lindsay May. Welcome, Anana. Thanks so much for having me, Joe. I'm so excited to speak to you today, beautiful Anana. And now I'm just going to let everybody know a little bit about you and what it is that you get up to. So, Anana is a writer, heart support a birth worker and a disruptor, supporting integrity and alignment across transitions. As a young girl, Anana has been aware of the importance of community spaces, space to heal and having space to go slow. She brings that into her work, into her work writing, supporting birth and disrupting broken, unhealthy spaces helping humans who feel broken and lost to come alive again. Oh, I love that. And that puts that song from The Greatest Showman in my head, which is like one that I listen to before these interviews to get me pumped. <laughs> I want to come alive. Um, anyway, so we're here to talk about spirituality and not The Greatest Showman, although I think loads of those songs actually could be about spirituality if we really go there and read the lyrics and feel into them. So I'm opening all these questions, all these interviews with this question. What does spirituality mean to you? And that's such a great question. To me, I think spirituality really, really is embodied by just like connection with self and intuition. I've been thinking about this for the last few days and, and navigating this conversation with lots of different humans as they've been asking me about this interview and about the experience of, of spirit versus kind of versus soul. And I've been loving considering how spirituality for me is nature. It's connection to nature. It's my heart connected to the land. It's my life as a mother connected to my daughter. It's, connected like like heart connected one to another to another like humans around the world it's like where we are where we don't live like where we live in our human bodies but where we live in connection to people people animals land air water mm. all of those parts beautiful Thank you. Thank you for adding another delicious flavor to the, the thoughts and ideas and descriptions that we've got around this beautiful subject. Thank you so much. I love that connection for me feels like such a big part of what spirituality is too. So just love that. What I would love to know next though, is having this beautiful description of spirituality being about connection or a big part of it being about connection. Has that always been part of your life or have there been some sort of triggering events that have opened you to explore your own spirituality? Mm. Also a great question. Oh goodness. So for me, in a way, it, in a way, absolutely. It's always been part of my life specifically the idea of community in that way and connection um, has been something that's been with me um, through ancestry with my grandmother. Um, and I took that into my experience of life when I was a teenager exploring, like really exploring herbalism and like pagan kind of roots and connection to, again, connection to the earth in different ways. Um, but there was a turning point for me because even at that time, I didn't understand that it was spirituality that was what I was connected to. I viewed, yeah, I viewed paganism as kind of like this weird subset of religion as like a, like a rebellion almost um, in like a new age kind of way. And um, I didn't find it very connective. Um, that's what I want to say about that. 
The turning point though that I experienced was actually in regards to intuition and my own experience with intuition and connection to self. Um, I have a 16 year old daughter. <laughs> we could get into another story <laughs> later about how you know her too. Um, but I have a 16 year old daughter and I was pregnant with her when I was, uh, I got pregnant with her when I was 18 and gave birth to her when I was 19. And the process and experience of choosing to um, both to keep that pregnancy and be connected to her and be connected to my intuition in how I understood what would later be defined to me as reincarnation and um, like past life experience with the soul that is in her human body now. Um, my intuition was just on target with everything. Um, I mean, it's, it's such a simplified way to say it in that like every decision I had was like, I would lean this way and I would get this nudge to the side and be like, okay, that's where we're going. Um, in choosing to, in choosing to walk this life with her and choosing to be a mom in this life, um, the connection I had, I knew was bigger than just me and what was like, quote unquote, right for me and was actually something much further ordained and destined, if you will. And part of my life in a bigger, in a bigger way. Um, and from making that choice and having, you know, having her and having motherhood be the kind of lineage of my life at this point, the biggest, strongest, almost most important part of my identity as well. I, I have gone on to travel all of these different paths of spirituality um, in my life and in my connection to my daughter. And it's taken me through quite a few different past life regressions um, different work, different healing, different energy work, um, coming into my work around birth and looking at ancestry kind of in that way and the trauma that we hold and just like, all of these different layers of things that come together that both mean spirituality for me and are also a way that I ritualize and create connection in the world um, in the way that I view spirituality. Um, and my experience with my daughter is profound and we both feel it consistently with each other that there's no way that she was not meant to be here on there on this earth and there's no way that i would be who i am um without an experience of life with her mm, i love that so much thank you so much for sharing that and um one of the beautiful things that I know from me as well is as I've started to trust my intuition and, you know, those little nudges, like you say, um, saying, you know, looking over here and then, like, oh, no, no, you're over here. And, and actually, when you start to follow them, life can feel in some ways easier, um, supported. It doesn't mean there's not challenges, but... Um, there's this, there can be this sense of, but this is, this feels right. So even through the challenge of it, this feels like my path and somehow that makes stepping into it feel easier. Absolutely. Oh my God. Well, yeah. I don't actually want to say, oh my God, I'll know sure. that. <laughs> it's really true. And I, I really, I really had a beautiful experience navigating that with with her when I was young um with my daughter when I was young and knowing that it was absolutely the right choice mm. absolutely and where that like the nudge the synchronicity of it it does it makes everything flow smoother I think it takes away fear when we're willing to trust those places also I mean it's in itself it's the nudge it's the consistency of knowing something but it's also taking away the fear, trust related to it. Yeah. yeah. I almost feel like I was just reverberating that, but I think that they, they work together and they're also individual stages kind of in the mm -hmm. process. Sometimes just trusting things is its own version of like spiritual practice. 
if you can mm-hmm. just learn to trust. Yes, and I'm not an easy one. Sorry. No, no, no. Absolutely, it's not an easy one at all. Um, and I think it's where it's it's where for me um, learning that process um, of my life in that way and the way that my life has kind of transitioned over the last five years having the opportunity to trust different paths in life and you know recognize that there's a purpose and kind of throw things to the wind and just go okay i'm going to follow this thing and see where it leads and like it has wild beautiful things in store that you would have never found on your own and it is it's there's so much freedom in allowing that process to you know to happen and to actually um, engage with it in kind of like an author uh i don't want to say authoritarian but like where the voice you have in engaging in it has authority to be able to take care of yourself in that way. Mm-hmm. Mm, I like that. You're full of powerful statements and powerful words. So that sounds perfect coming from you. <laughs> My next question for you is, can you share your story? So since that time and, and, and any highs and lows, what, whatever stands out, um, whatever feels right to share would be amazing. Mm. Highs and lows since that time are beautiful. Um, I'm going to sit with that just for a second. Mm. I think the most interesting story that I want to share, that I can share to this, I feel like a lot of things that have happened to me in my life don't necessarily feel like good fodder for stories in a way, but something that is entirely um, part of the process for me in that way um, is, hang on a second, the dog's just shaking and distracting me. (laughs) So one of the stories that I have um, it's actually related kind of to this process of dis- some disruption in my life. Um, about four years ago, um, after the end of a relationship, I decided to leave um, where I was living, which was in New York City at the time. And I knew I was feeling called back to land, back to trees, very, mm-hmm. very specifically. Um, but I wasn't quite sure where I was going yet. and and the place and like what the place was that was calling me for the record. I still don't quite know. So I'm rather transient kind of in this process of rerouting myself, but I was really scared of not knowing and not having an answer. And I knew that, um, I knew that there would be an answer. And I knew that I could figure it out on my own too, but I was, I was very much really wanting the experience of knowing the next step, like having it present itself right in front of me and being able to step into it. And it just like nothing existed in that way. It kept being, you know, completely obsolete. And what I ended up doing um, was I'm sorry. I'm a little distracted. I know you, you could probably, I don't know if you're going to edit this, but no, we were then. It's all good. It's fine. We can hear your dog and that's okay. I can pause it if you want. Just a second. Ready? Mm -hmm. You can go. So I wasn't quite sure of what the next step would be. I was, I I suppose actually, I was deeply mistrustful of myself and of the world in the process. And even though I had all of these tools at the time, this story will actually be interesting to encompass some of the things that I was feeling called to share with you. Um, I was feeling distrustful and I had all of these tools. I had been, um, um, I have, I have the tools as a master Reiki practitioner. I have been doing tarot readings my entire life. I have all of this um, experience with my Cherokee and Mohawk lineage. I, like, 
you know, connection to astrology, connection to the stars, connection to the land in different ways, connection to music and drumming, um, connection to herbs and flowers and um, mantra practices. And I got to this point where I started recognizing a little bit of cultural appropriation happening for me and using things that weren't tools that I, that I really knew, as well as where I was using tools, I was re heavily reliant, like almost in a way that felt like an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction to the tools that I was using. And I felt like I couldn't even walk out my front door without, without doing an entire card spread, you know, to be able to kind of garner myself to get out the door and like get into my day and get into the world and figure out what, what would happen in life for me at that moment in the day or like for the next three months whatever it was. I was also dealing with some health issues and some adrenal fatigue. And I, I started learning basically um, what surrender actually was. And that surrender was not something that was attainable or achievable as, you know, something to like caption and, and, you know, have a goal towards, but that actually the utter terror that I was feeling at not knowing what would happen next really put me on my knees. And I remember my experience in life in general, I'd say for all of life, has me in this way where when life is hard, I'll just look up, look up at the sky. I'm not looking at God. I don't believe that there is one God. I don't believe that even if there were one God that we could call him a him or her a her. So I find myself, I like look up at the sky and I'm like, all right, guys, everybody up there, what are you doing? <laughs> and it's like, ah, just what are you doing? Um, not, and not necessarily in frustration either, you know, with a good amount of levity, but I would find myself on my knees and constantly, constantly on my knees. I'd be like, why, why that way? Like, why aren't you telling me? And finally, I started being able to hear that there were answers on the other side. You know, that I, I would like let out all of this frustration and I'd open my eyes and there'd be like a butterfly in front of me. And I'd be like, oh, right. There are signs everywhere. We just have to look at them. Okay, let me start looking more. And along the line of this story, where I'm going with this story is that I want to have more children. And a few years before I left New York, I would have these worries that it would never happen. I like hadn't met anyone and like I couldn't fathom doing it by myself again and just all of these different layers. And I started doing past life regression work and connecting to my daughter in past lives and connecting to moments of death for me in past lives. And I kept, I started having these dreams actually, uh, future dreams of um, meeting people at different times and being 40 years old. This is interesting too, because the, this story I've told a lot, but it feels very vulnerable to share here. Um, but I've had this story, this, this dream vision that I've had over a dozen times at different points in the last four or five years of like meeting someone when I'm 40 years old. And um, as a birth worker, I want to just say that it is fully possible to have a child at 40 <laughs> naturally. Um, and in this vision, my daughter would come home. She would come home from art school in Paris. And she would go, mom, you're pregnant. This is wonderful. I know this is what you've always wanted. And I started, I started kind of like waking up from these dreams and going, oh, oh, it could happen. Oh, I can relax. Oh, if I just relax and like actually hand this over, hand this vision of possibility and like the the fullness and richness of this possibility, if I can hand this over, I won't be worried, which means I won't have anxiety, which means I won't be you know, fearful and terrified, which means I can actually do what it is that I need to be doing for the next few years of life 
until this thing happens. And I can just trust it's going to happen. And I feel like that moment in time, um, those dreams and everything that I was going through at that time, um, it really solidified for me the idea of trust and of surrender and of recognizing when there are hard moments and unknown things and how I work with them really well. I'm not afraid of the dark and the shadows and death ultimately of anything in our experience in life as well as this life from this life. And, and yet these little unknown things sometimes, you know, like not being able to see the top of the hill and just what's over the, the hill terrify me. And I started understanding that if I can just be over here and say, okay, I'm terrified and I'm still going to go through it instead of trying to convince myself that there's nothing to be scared of. And within that experience, it was like, it's like multiple circles in this experience um, coming back around to themselves. In this experience, I started recognizing that it was really great to have tools in a toolbox, but I was totally addicted to them and I needed to stop. And I gave away all of my Oracle cards and all of my tarot cards and all of my crystals. I was really big into crystals and I just said, like, I recognize that these things have value, but I've been putting too much on them, expecting them to somehow be the healing. And I don't believe that they don't have power and that they can't be useful, but I was recognizing that for especially, especially for a lot of my community, there was a lot of energy going into these things being used as like healing modalities. Um, and also creating this kind of false stereotype that like you weren't worthy if you didn't have a bunch of crystals. If you didn't know what the crystals were, you weren't cool enough. Like, and we wouldn't, you know, and like there was this thing that was happening. And, and um, so it just like kind of naturally came about that I was like, oh, I need to let go of all of this stuff because like, you know, I know it's great. I know it has its mo, it has its place. And it's, it's not being used right, right now. Um, and I think I let go of everything with the exception of a book, two books on different spiritual practices. And I would sit in meditation every morning for an hour and then make myself write instead of pulling cards and, you know, using crystals and like sending Reiki to myself and just kind of like cut out all of these things. And I would just sit there with my body and then I would go hug a tree and I would go find a tree and I would go find water and I would make that my like point of access maybe like three or four times a day for months and months and months and months and months until I felt like I had something underneath me again that I knew that wasn't going anywhere and that I didn't have to take with me, which was also kind of part of why it was a beautiful journey for me to kind of get to that place because currently I move around a lot. I don't have a home in one place with roots. This body is my home. There is a suitcase of things that accompanies this body as a home and I couldn't put all my crystals in this, in the suitcase. <laughs> so it was perfect that that happened. And I realized that anywhere that I was, I could get out of my, you know, I could get out of a car and be on pavement and be in front of a Walmart and I could, you know, dislike the Walmart and dislike the idea of capitalism that would exist in that. And I could breathe and feel the air and know that there was more working with me and for me and for all of us out here in the world. Beautiful. I, I, I love that you've included that. <clears throat> and I'm sure there'll be a few people listening that are like, oh, don't tell me I have to give away my cards, <laughs> crystals. But it's not about that, is it? It's about that, as you say, what becomes a dependency on something else. Like it's almost in the same way that we think, oh, well, if I own this bigger house or if I own the car, you know, the, ca the capitalism thing, then I'll be happy. You know, if, we're, if we realize that we're putting so much of, how we feel into the objects, then we've kind of lost the point of the objects. So, oh, 
Thank you so much for sharing that. But my next question might bring objects back in again. <laughs> I'm very curious. How do you weave spirituality through your life and through your work? Hmm. So how I weave spirituality through my life and through my work is through presence. I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, maybe the biggest, if not only way. Um, and maybe that wasn't true four years ago, 12 years ago, 20 years ago, um, but it's definitely what has been true for the last few years. and. Um, what I, what I definitely am aware of and most present to for myself is that presence is both the channel and the access, as well as like how it is exchanged constantly and consistently. I support a lot of event spaces as well as, um, you know, for the birth work that I do, um, as a doula and supporting, supporting birth and labor. Um, eye contact, eye gazing, breath work, like physical body presence, touch, knowing that there's another body here with you to like help you find that grounding so that you can find like that channel through. Um, and you now it's, it's interesting. I, I've been wondering how I do that myself recently as I've been dating a lot. And because I find masculine energy with men, I find navigating masculine energy in men interesting. Um, I can navigate feminine energy well with men, but masculine energy feels so, it feels so like Viking strong with like, horns you know where I'm like how do I be present like what is the version of being present to that to meet it in a way that's actually meeting it and um you know and that energy exists within all of us too so I've been you know back and forth kind of navigating that in myself and um it's like presence and I think empathy then is what comes in just that like humanity maybe mm -hmm. humanity the end of the day um, um, and I think the way that I would also describe that is in, in looking at inclusion and especially like racism and the way that racism exists in the USA right now, like there is a way that presence is not enough. Like there has to be action to things. Um, and there's a way of having compassion and empathy and also I was using this analogy the other day. It's kind of also like, um, like pulling someone in by the hand and like not let, like there's the compassion and empathy and then you're holding their hand and willingly consentingly holding someone's hand and like not letting them go to be able to drop the ball on something. And I think that that's the way that it moves through me. Um, I'm able to see people and their potential and their discomfort and offer love to their discomfort. I know on a whole other level, you could speak to your own personal experience in that with me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that very much for me is, is like how I embody and channel and, and like alchemize spirituality um, and like spirit these days, um, there's a part of me that misses crystals and being able to be like this, this thing is the thing, but more, you know, I recognize that it's a beautiful adornment. It's a beautiful way to be devotional. Um, but I want it to come only out of my heart, only from my heart with no other mediums in between. Mm, I love all of that. 
I, I really enjoy the way that you talk of presence as being the channel and the access and the exchange. And I just think that's so like, it talks to that, how I show up in the world. And it talks to that also um, action piece of, as you say, holding people up to allow them in your loving, supportive way that you do to allow them to be the best that they can be in and through their discomfort. So, and I love your Facebook page. I think it says like, I love you and something like people can hate for no reason. So I'm allowed to love you for no reason. <laughs> Look, how great is that? That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of that. And I actually, um, I was just, yeah, I was curious as to whether objects came in and I love that they didn't because I think presence is so just the key. I love it. Beautiful. Um, my last question for you is what advice would you have for somebody interested to explore, but hasn't done a lot of exploration yet? <laughs> oh, that is a fabulous and fascinating question. You know, interestingly enough, the, the, the little intuitive nudge that I'm getting in that is, actually comes back to where like where I stepped away from my toolbox but where for someone interested for someone feeling uncertain and wanting to approach you know approach and get involved kind of and figure out their version of spirituality it would be to create a toolbox like we need the toolbox we at least need the toolbox and you hope that your pipe is never going to, you know, explode and that you're never going to have a water leak. And when you do, you'll need that one thing that is in your toolbox in the back of your closet, you know. But I think, I think that for sure is a piece of it. Um, and I think that that toolbox in reality would include not necessarily like things as much as finding your own way of an access point. Like, how do you feel the most comfortable? How do you feel the most inspired? Like, what are the things that do that? Is it music? Is it dancing? How do you feel the most comfortable in your body? Um, like, what does that? Is it a shower and like such deep, you know, self-care and adoration and reverence for the body? Um, you know, like, in a way, like, how do you feel sexy? How do you feel strong? How do you feel kind? What is it that, that brings those things? And then looking at those answers, looking at those answers to kind of figure out and find the supportive tools for each part of that. Um, as I'm saying this, I'm aware that at the time I, at the time I hadn't quite gotten into paganism yet. Um, and I could still consider God, God. And I went to church every weekend with my mom because we went to church. We just went to church. I'm not really sure what we did there. But we went to church. Um, at that time in my life, I, my, my tool in that respect would have been a pair of running sneakers and I would have gone for a run every day. And through that experience, I would find myself talking out loud in my head and getting answers in my head. And, you know, so that particular piece of like, I, I needed to feel movement and like strength in my body. So I exercised, so I went running. And that for me was a connection to the divine, like a connection to, to source and the divine and myself ultimately everything that lives within. Um, so running sneakers, you know, whatever, sneakers, weights, a jump rope, a practice that might look something like um, movement in the yogic tradition, um, drinking coffee with a perfect mug, like the perfect milk and perfect source of sweetener, the mm. things that create the things that create that help us create space and create stillness 
so that we can get inside. For me, that's not, uh, for me, art works differently. Making art and creating art works a little bit differently. Even my writing um, doesn't necessarily feel like spirituality and like connection to source as much as it feels like actually building something. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, art is the modality. Um, you know, that, that channels, that creates access, that alchemizes things, that builds things that are able to also come back inside. Um, so like exploring all of, like, I don't know, make up other answers to that question too. I'm not coming up with any in this moment. I'm thinking kind of of like, how do we nourish ourselves? And like, then what are those roots of nourishment? And then from there, the tool in someone's toolbox might be a marker and, you know, might be a marker and a pad of paper, it might be a pencil and a pad of paper. It might be an awesome set of kitchen knives to be able to cook because cooking foods is one way of like creation. And I think that building that toolbox and then spending, like creating a relationship with everything in that way of those tools and of that connection to self and making the space to have that relationship is like what creates the practice. Mm, yay. I love that. That's fantastic. Um, this idea of a toolbox with the things that open your access point, like your channel, your, your connection and whatever that feels and is for you. Um, I certainly know friends who for them running is that, you know, that runs, she runs so far. She's like, I have to run for more than an hour, Joe, because my brain chatters for the first hour. And then after that, I find stillness, you know, I'm like, wow that's a really long way as a non-runner um I love it I love all of those ideas and gardening and a gardening can be for for some people that just love getting their hands in the dirt and watching mother nature's magic with their help you know oh so thank you thank you so much for being here um I want to complete with how can people tell us a bit more about what you do and how people can find you if they're curious to connect some more Hmm. <laughs> Part of me wanted to just say, just come knock at my door. I don't really know where else you can find me, but just come knock on my door, even though that's not entirely true. Um, best places to find me are on Instagram, where I love pictures as a, as a former photographer. I love I love pictures. I love images. I love the beauty of scenes and images and words. Um, and on Facebook, where I have a lot of um, disrupting conversation. And on Patreon, where you can uh, read fun words, find healing in them, support me, support, um, I was going to say support me, and also in supporting me, support um, the lineages that I have learned from. Um, I have a very firm um, exchange experience around um, information that has come to me and learning that has come to me and making sure that reciprocation happens. So uh, for the most part, in the way of Patreon, um, whatever I collect in donations and funds goes a lot back into the world. And I am, you know, it's not something that will be, that will be up um, on your page, but I'm writing a book. And when that book comes out, I look forward to it being another access point. Um, I'm going to keep the title of it hushed for the moment because it's a little racy. Mm -hmm. And of course it is. Of course it is. Why would it be anything else <laughs> with me? Um, but that story is more or less a story of identity in the way of spirituality um, as it connects to love in the world and how um, love is not only a romantic thing, but is you know, romanticized to be only a romantic thing. Um, and mm -hmm. Navigating that idea of, of love and 
And interestingly enough, um, the nickname I've always had in this life is actually Sunshine. And the sun is the most pivotal part of spirituality for me. It's like the biggest prayer in this world is to see the sunrise and to see the sunset. So I think energetically, like if, if you're on here and you're like, oh, I'm loving what you're doing and I'm over here and I'm never going to explore those things. Cool. Use it as a channel and like, look at the sun every day. Look at the moon every night. Like have that connection to the world. Mm. Beautiful. I love that. And I love you. And I'm so grateful to have had you here with us and share all of the magic that you shared with us today thank you so much Anana. you're welcome so much i'm so grateful and touched and i feel so so privileged and delighted to be able to be here and offer another perspective and i love you i'm so grateful that you are doing this and feeling called in this way mm -hmm so everyone there we go there's our conversation with the beautiful Anana today and if you loved it tell us what your takeaways are write them underneath um, send us any questions and we are here for you you can jump on the Facebook group if you're interested in doing that and I would love to connect and we'll see you soon with the next story bye for now <laughs>